Welcome to the Psych Central Show, where each episode presents an in-depth look at issues from the field of psychology and mental health, with host Gabe Howard and co-host Vincent M. Wales. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Psych Central Show podcast. My name is Gabe Howard, and I am sitting here, as always, with Vincent M. Wales. And we have Dr. John Grohall, the editor-in-chief of Psych Central and also the founder and, well, coincidentally, our boss. So we're really excited to get to that. But before we do, we want to remind everybody about the survey that we're doing. It's really easy to fill out. Just go to psychcentral.com slash show, find the yellow button, click on it. There's 10 questions. You can even talk back and well, tell us how you feel. And additionally, don't forget about betterhelp.com. Go to betterhelp.com slash psychcentral. Try it out for a week for free. John, Dr. Grohall, how are you? We're glad that you're here. It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you guys here today. I'm looking forward to our discussion. So the reason that we asked you to be on the show is because conspiracy theories, they, they make the rounds whenever something big happens in our society. So right now, you know, it's the Las Vegas shootings. And within, man, I, I think less than 24 hours, uh, there was just all of these, you know, I want to say alternate facts, not, not to be a, a, a smarty pants, but conspiracy theories just sort of came out of nowhere about this. And of course, they've happened with 9-11. They've, they've happened with airplane chemtrails. So the question that a lot of people want to know is, what is exactly a conspiracy theory? And then, of course, the follow-up question is, where do they come from? Conspiracy theories are simply explanations that refer to hidden groups working in secret to achieve sinister objectives. And that's according to a researcher back in 1994 who helped formulate a, a clear definition so researchers could move forward with additional research into this area in psychology. And I think the important part there is that there, there's something going on that the mainstream news media or that the, uh, the government doesn't want you to understand, and they're doing it for, for their own reasons and objectives. John, one of the things that has always occurred to me is that I think a lot of people are just incapable of thinking that such horrible things can happen just as a matter of course, that there has to have been a purpose behind it, that evil people did it or what have you, because it's just, it's just too much for them to accept. Yeah, I, I believe that as well. I think that there, our minds seek out a, a rationale, that something that will help put a horrible event or tragedy into some sort of perspective, into some sort of understanding, uh, so we can point to, to something that helps wrap our, our minds around the tragedy. And the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of times there's so much tragedy that happens every day in life that doesn't really have an explanation. I mean, if you, if you look at the 30,000 plus people who die every year by suicide or the people who die from medical errors while in a hospital, um, the people who die in a car accident, I think it's, it's our, our brains really try, working hard to try and put some of this into, into context and, and, and have it make sense. To make sense of a senseless situation. Indeed. And this is the problem with, with random thoughts. Random is just random. We, we don't, there, there's no reason. As you've said, it's, it's senseless, it's random, there's no rationale. And as, as you all know, I, I work as a speaker in, in mental health uh, and mental illness. And the number one question I get asked is, man, why are mentally ill people so violent? And of course, as somebody living with bipolar disorder, this just makes me immediately cringe. And I always sort of answer this way. I say, you know, I wish that all of the violence was caused by people with mental illness, because then we could just get people diagnosed. We'd find out that they have a mental illness. We'd separate them from the rest of society and boom, violence free. And when people hear that, they're like, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, but they want to be able to see it coming. So they invent this idea that they can spot violence by way of, in this case, a medical diagnosis. So when we look at the specific thing that's in the media right now, which is the Vegas shooting, why do you think that conspiracy theorists want to believe that it's anything more than one evil guy? That's actually quite believable. It's believable that one person with an assault rifle could do that kind of damage. There's nothing that's hard to understand about that, except for, of course, the level of evil. Well, I think one of the challenges that the Internet presents is that it, it brings together a lot of people um, who can sort of 
be amateur private investigators on their own time, calling over uh, video evidence and uh, sound files and eyewitness reports and believing that there's a thread that the law enforcement folks are missing by their own observations of the video or whatnot. N not taking into account, of course, that a lot of what they're seeing is, is usually pretty grainy, uh, poorly took video, poorly recorded audio that, uh, you know, if held up to any kind of expert scrutiny in a laboratory, of course, would instantly disintegrate in terms of its viability at, as supporting that kind of theory. And in this case, I, I think I think that's what drove the idea that there was a second shooter on the fourth floor was because people were seeing video and there were some reflections on some glass. And they took that to mean that those reflections equal gunshots. And before you know it, once you have someone who says, oh, I own 20 guns myself and I, under I, I know what a gunshot looks like and that's a gunshot, you know, suddenly you have 20 other people in that, you know, on the subreddit or some other discussion forum on the internet chiming in and saying, yes, I, I'm also a gun expert and I also see the exact same thing. And before you know it, you have a whole conspiracy theory growing and growing. And before you know, within a few days, you have tens of thousands of people believing with very scant evidence, uh, if you can even call it that, um, in this whole idea that there's a second shooter. How much of this is just plain old, we don't trust the government? And by we, the, the conspiracy theorists don't trust the government. The government, the law enforcement says, we see one thing, they say, we don't believe you. Is there an element of that going on? Just a, a pervasive distrust of authority figures by certain members of our society? Yeah, the psychological research I looked at, it did find a little bit of that. They found that, uh, you know, one of the things that characterizes a person who believes in conspiracy theories is that they're, they're more likely to feel alienated and socially isolated. And these are people who don't really feel connected to their fellow citizen in America. There are people who um, already feel like they've been left out of society, that they don't have maybe any close friends. And so they turn to the internet where they find friends, of course, but they're friends who are like themselves, who are also alienated and socially isolated. And so they kind of, they thrive on each other and can build up a community that really uh, reinforces this kind of behavior. Thank you, Dr. Grohal. We're going to continue discussing conspiracy theories and the people who believe them right after this word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face -face session. Go to betterhelp.com forward slash psych central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. Betterhelp.com forward slash psych central. Welcome back, everyone. We are here talking with Dr. John Grohall, and the subject of the day is conspiracy theories. John, one of the things that, that often occurs to me, too, is that the people who are really into the whole conspiracy theory movement, are they just attention seekers? Yeah, I think that could be a part of it. One of the, the findings of, in the psychology research is that believing in this conspiracy theory and believing that they have found unique evidence that, that no one else has found certainly can make a person feel special. And I think it's one of the, the things that drives a person to believe in a conspiracy theory because they have special knowledge and they, are more they feel like they are more informed about this, this kind of event that they believe in, that they, they understand the, the underlying reasons for this, these alternative facts that no one else believes in because they, they, they have access to information that no one else has. Right. And that makes, that can make a person feel very special, which is very reinforcing. And um, it can help explain why a person really clings to a conspiracy theory, even in the face of uh, factual evidence that shows them otherwise. 
Well, aside from the idea of being considered the expert, I mean, that, that's the, I want to say the nice thing about making something up, nobody can disprove that you're wrong. Uh, if, if you have a conspiracy theory and you own it lock, stock and barrel, then you can manipulate how the story goes and therefore you become the ultimate authority figure. So I, I understand the drive for attention, you know, doing that for the attention, but could there also be a drive that it makes you feel safe? I mean, if I invent a conspiracy theory that if I drink, you know, Diet Coke every day, I will become bulletproof. That, that's nonsense. But if I truly believe it, then I would feel safer around guns. Do you think that sometimes that plays into it as well? Or do they just know they're wrong? I think what we know from the research is that it, it really seems to be more about the individual's who are believing these conspiracy theories rather than uh, the the actual facts or the circumstances around the event that they're that they have these beliefs. It really just seems like there's a combination of personality traits and characteristics that characterize a person who is more likely to believe in conspiracy theories, and that helps explain the popularity of them because there's a significant minority of people who, who have those traits and characteristics in, in society. And I think the internet, as wonderful a tool it is, also helps amplify this effect because it is an amplifier of everything. Uh, whether it's good, bad, or, or neutral, the internet doesn't care. It amplifies everything. So the fact that you can bring together within 24 hours of the, the Las Vegas shootings there was a Facebook group uh, started that already has 5,000 members um, that was talking about con the conspiracy theories about second shooter. So um, it, it takes very little time for people to come together and find each other on the internet to start discussing these theories and, and amplifying the signal of the theory. The whole thing about conspiracy theories that it just, it brings to mind the entire field of cognitive bias, right? I mean, because we have, we have different biases when we look at things. In this kind of a, of a situation, is there a certain amount of self-serving bias to it as well, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, it's connected to that. If it makes a person feel more special, it makes them feel less alienated, less socially isolated, and it plays into their existing beliefs of trust and mistrust of the government and any kind of authority figure that they might have. And I think it, it's something that comes more natural to people with those characteristics. And so it, it does become sort of a self-serving narrative that they paint for themselves. Up until now, we've been talking about conspiracy theories on the idea that the person who is inventing them is, is, is honest. They, they believe that they are correct. Uh, they're ignoring evidence, they have their own personal biases, they won't listen to reason, but, but at their core, they believe that it's true. Do you think that conspiracy theories are also invented by people that just know they're flat out wrong? They're just trying to control the way people think or, I don't know, maybe run for public office? I think there probably are people who may chime in or invent a conspiracy theory in order to play a game that they're just enjoying for themselves. But I think those kind of uh, kinds of people are in the minority and not a significant portion of people who believe in conspiracy theories. So in, in general, would it be safe to say that the research shows that the majority of people who believe in conspiracy theories are genuine? They, they, they believe that they're right. They're not just being disagreeable or, or they're con men. They're, they're sincere. They honestly believe that they see something that everybody else missed and they don't understand why people aren't listening to them. Yeah, absolutely. So let's say that you have a member of your family that believes that the world is flat, for example. We know that the world's not flat. It, it's untrue, but they truly believe it. And then the, the world is flat, turns into you can't trust the government, turns into they're, they're making clones of us, that they're turning into super soldiers. And you're worried about your loved one, but they're operating perfectly normal in all other areas of their life. You know, they have a job, they pay bills, et cetera, but they, they cling to these conspiracy theories as though they're facts. What, what, should, what should we do? So the good news is that most people who believe in conspiracy theories actually only believe in very specific theories. So you'll find that, that a person who doesn't believe in the moon landing, humans landed on the moon and we took photographs and stuff, 
doesn't necessarily mean that they don't believe that terrorists brought down 9-11. So they tend to be very distinct and, and kind of stand alone-ish. They don't necessarily bleed into one another. Um, and there's no sense that most people who believe in conspiracy theories sort of, sort of believe in all of them. I think people who do believe in conspiracy theories are very particular about the ones that they believe in and have very particular reasoning for, for believing in those specific ones. I, I don't think that in most people there's a fear that this is going to generalize and they're going to start kind of going off the deep end into conspiracy theories in, in, for everything. That would be a sign of uh, more serious mental health concern that maybe the, the person should seek assistance for. And I probably could, you know, we could probably do a whole show about how you can effectively combat conspiracy theories in other people. One of the simplest ways is to not push the point not argue and not rationalize with the person just because you have to question, is this worth it? Is, is my relationship with this person going to improve by having this discussion with them where they seem to be very set in their facts and their, and their beliefs about this event or, or whatnot? And if the answer is, uh, this probably isn't going to benefit the relationship and it's not going to help grow our relationship, and their belief in this theory doesn't really impact my life directly, then it's probably one of those things where you let sleeping dogs lie. It's, it's not, it's just don't bring it up in, in a topic of conversation. John, I think you just described about 80% of my Facebook relationships right there. <laughs> you described Thanksgiving <laughs> at my house. We're not allowed to discuss <laughs> politics, religion, <laughs> money. We just, we have so many Look, rules. We just stare at each other. <laughs> Look, we'd be hard pressed not to, ha you know, be able to cite a, a friend or a family member who believes in at least one conspiracy theory. My mom believes that we never went to the moon, and that's fine. We initially thought that was, you know, amusing and and unbelievable, and we tried to reason with her a little bit. But then you get to a point where, uh, what's the point? Uh, she believes what she believes, and it's not going to impact my life one way or the other if I try and convince her that it, it is true that we did go into the moon. And so it's just a topic that we don't bring up. But there's actually been some research that has looked into what might be effective in helping you to have these conversations with conspiracy theorists in your life. And the research has found um, that two interventions seem to work. One is that if the theory isn't very strongly held by the person, that rationalizing with them can work, and that providing them with facts for a loosely held conspiracy theory and evidence and experts and things like that may be able to help sort of loosen the grip that the person has on that theory. The second intervention they've found is that ridiculing actually can be effective. And that the ridiculing uh, should be focused on the deficiency of the believer's thinking, not on the conspiracy theory itself, but the fact that the believer of the theory isn't actually being very logical or rational about their beliefs. And so obviously if you were going to try and use the ridiculing intervention, you'd, you'd want to do it with someone that you have a very strong relationship with that, that could withstand um, that kind of challenge. So, Because it, it does sound rather counterintuitive. I mean, I, when you said that, I, I immediately thought, what? Are you kidding me? Yeah, I had this vision mm -hmm. of me insulting my brother at Christmas. I, that, that's the first thing that popped in my head. I'm just going to walk up and call him stupid. Uh, but but it, when you say ridicule, do you mean like just be negative or actual? You're not trying to determine the logical connection between the objects and the attributes that are part of the conspiracy. It, it's about the person's not very rigorous rational thinking process that goes that has led them to have that belief so it has to be obviously done very delicately and tactfully and it's not necessarily something that uh, most people would be comfortable with or necessarily have the skills to actually do tactfully 
So I, I, this is something that they researchers did in a laboratory setting and trying to put it into sort of real world use might be a lot more work. And of course, both of these strategies, the, rash, the rationalizing and the ridiculing, only work for cons conspiracy theories that are not closely held, that are not strongly held by the, the other person. If someone really, really believes that um, Kennedy was assassinated by the mafia or wh whoever, y neither of these interventions are going to be very effective. I appreciate that, Dr. Groha. You know, the conspiracy theories have been interesting, and they, they seem to have uh, cropped up a lot in the last decade, although I know they've really been around probably since there was more than three people in a room. But you see them faster and faster, more and more, and it, they're more and more fanciful. It's just amazing to hear them come out and what people believe. And I have to wonder what impact it is having on relationships and our society in general. So thank you for bringing light to it. Yeah, my pleasure. I think it's an important topic. And as you've noted that we do see them coming up more and more often. And because of the internet, we're being able to, um, people are being able to find each other much more easily than pre-internet days having discussions about the conspiracy theories and therefore I think they sort of take a life, uh, take on a life of their own, and uh, make it even harder to sort of combat them on a generalized basis. Because uh, suddenly you have entire websites devoted to exploring a conspiracy theory to depths that you just could not believe. Yeah, and they're instant and easily accessible, and they involve large numbers of people, which tends to lend credibility. Uh, if enough people believe something, you start to believe, well, hey, we can't all be wrong. <laughs> yep. But you can. <laughs> but you can. But you can. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Remember, you can get one week of convenient, affordable, private online counseling anytime, anywhere by visiting betterhelp.com slash psych central. The first week is on us, so please check it out. We'll see you all next week. Thank you for listening to the Psych Central Show. Please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you found this podcast. We encourage you to share our show on social media and with friends and family. Previous episodes can be found at psychcentral.com slash show. Psychcentral.com is the Internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website. Psych Central is overseen by Dr. John Grohall, a mental health expert and one of the pioneering leaders in online mental health. Our host, Gabe Howard, is an award-winning writer and speaker who travels nationally. You can find more information on Gabe at GabeHoward.com. Our co-host, Vincent M. Wales, is a trained suicide prevention crisis counselor and author of several award-winning speculative fiction novels. You can learn more about Vincent at VincentMWales.com. If you have feedback about the show, please email talkback at psychcentral.com.